This is Federalist 29, Part 5. Uh, please make sure that you watch the previous parts, otherwise this is not going to make sense. Um, I'll start with the paragraph that says, towards the end, if there should be an army to be made use of as the engine of despotism, what need of the militia? If there should be no army, whither would be the militia would the militia irritated by being called upon to undertake a distant and hopeless expedition for the purpose of riveting the chains of slavery upon a part of their countrymen, direct their course, but to the seat of the tyrants who had meditated so foolish as well as so wicked a project to crush them in their imagined entrenchments of power and to make them an example of the just vengeance of an abused and incensed people. He's continuing from the previous part, and he says, do not expect the militia of one state, let's say of Georgia, to go all the way to the north to oppress the people of the north and vice versa. He says he's really mad at the anti-federalists that are saying things about militia and saying things about the new constitution that is not true, that is not going to happen. Uh, he says you have to be crazy to think that something like that would happen. Is this the way in which usurpers stride to dominion over a numerous and enlightened nation? Do they begin by exciting the detestation of the very instrument of their intended usurpations? Do they usually commence their career by wanton and disgustful acts of power calculated to answer no end but to draw upon themselves universal hatred and execration? Are suppositions of this sort the sober admonition of discerning patriots to a discerning people, or are they the inflammatory ravings of incendiaries or distempered enthusiasts? See the kinds of words he uses, the adjectives he uses for anti-federalists. Let me repeat this again. Or are they the inflammatory ravings of incendiaries or distempered enthusiasts? If we were even to suppose the national rulers actuated by the most ungovernable, ungovernable ambition, it is impossible to believe that they would employ such preposterous means to accomplish their designs. So he says, all these imaginary things you're saying about what the federal government might do with the militia to take away your freedoms. He says, you've just gone crazy. You've, you've, you've allowed the sickness in your mind and heart. He says, this is not going to happen. In times of insurrection or invasion, it would be natural and proper that the militia of a neighboring state should be marched into another to resist the common enemy or to guard the republic against the violence of faction or sedition. This was frequently the case in respect to the first object in the course of the late war. And this mutual succor is indeed a principal end of our political association. If the power of affording it be placed under the direction of the Union, there will be no danger of a supine and listless in attention to the dangers of a neighbor, till its near approach has superadded the incitements of self-preservation to the too feeble impulses of duty and sympathy. He says, yes, it is okay to think that, let's say, just like this last, uh, just like this, when he says this last war, he's talking about the Revolutionary War. He says, during the Revolutionary War, of course, if North Carolina or South Carolina was invaded by the British, 
one of these neighboring states would send their militia to help. It's natural because they're close by. So, and that is what might happen under the direction of the Union. It's only in extreme cases that maybe a militia from this area will be sent way up there, especially in 1787 because of transportation, the time it took. Now, it's different. By the time you get to the Civil War of the United States in 1861, especially in the north, you've got trains, uh, canals, rivers, uh, can travel much faster. So yes, you will have uh, soldiers from New Hampshire or Vermont go all the way south here into Virginia because transportation had changed. You're talking about eight decades later, seven to eight decades later. But at that time, transportation was difficult. So he says, don't listen to these crazy anti-federalists who have gone crazy and are criticizing us and saying things that we will never do and we will never expect because Americans are not going to do that. Because just keep in mind that culturally these areas were very different. People who study, uh, people who look at America right now and study its history, especially you who are from another part of the world, you're an immigrant or you're living somewhere else and you're learning the English language, you might be listening to these uh, videos. These areas were very, very different. You know, historians say that a lot of people did not know what was going on outside of the radius, 30 miles radius of where you lived. The chances are like if you lived in North Carolina and you were not a trader, you know, get on a ship, go somewhere else and come back. If you lived in this area of North Carolina, you probably would not live, leave where you lived at all. If you did, it would be just within a radius of 10, 20, 30 miles. So these places were culturally very different and at that time, it would be crazy to expect that somebody from Massachusetts would want to do anything going down here and staying in South Carolina because the cultures were different. And that's why in this Federalist, he actually says, don't expect somebody from Massachusetts to go to be around and be comfortable around the haughty way of these aristocratic plantation owners of Virginia. So keep that in mind, and uh, we will go to Federalist 30, the next videos. Again, I don't want to overemphasize this, but uh, make sure you read along when you listen, at least for the first time or the second time, and then make sure you watch the videos of the lectures that whose... Uh, which I have mentioned. These are different professors talking about their books or talking about the subject matter, and you can learn a lot from that.